A TV writer's room is not very PC. It can be a pretty masculine environment. Oh, I saw most of the writers. I'm not overly worried about masculinity. <laughs> what is wrong with my bits? You're a little old and a little white. I need you. You love me. No, I didn't say that. Happy Monday, everybody. Happiest of Mondays. So I had the most vivid dream last night about, like, right before the robot apocalypse of, like, computers were becoming self-aware and stuff, and me and some other people knew about it, and we were trying to stay ahead of, like, avoiding anything with cameras and stuff. And I'd be at, like, hotels and resorts just constantly on the move. It was one of the most vivid dreams I've had. And... We found like a little EMP pulse that could kind of stop them or disable them and stuff. And this is so funny because I had a vivid dream as well. It was a variation on the. Uh, remember how my recurring nightmare used to be? Wait, please, it's the same dream, and we were sent a message from the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a very. So don't I don't say that because I'd make it feel I, be bad. Never mind. I used to have uh, uh, vivid dreams of a recurring nightmare of like, I'm halfway through the stage show and realize that none of it's set up. But now my new recurring nightmare is I'm trying to get all my bags from point A to point B and the bags keep not being where they are. Only this one had the extra twist of I was walking around a place that was trying to sell me a car, but then they also had robotic surgery that they were offering, and I kept snagging things on equipment that fell over, and they kept getting more and more angry, and no matter where I went, I just kept destroying. It was a very weird thing, Stream. Yeah, no, that's... that's uh... Pretty much the same dream. Yeah, pretty much the same dream. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just had had a dream this vivid and I still remember details from it. It was very intense. And But but um, I think I think there's something to that because I will never believe a hotel that promises me privacy as we go farther in the future. But I do believe that a band of committed people could keep out running uh, to make it not worthwhile for somebody to try to sabotage your your privacy, where it's like you're just constantly one step ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think I think I think you have a good solution there. I bet there's privacy I, I on the just, moon. I, I don't I don't know what the dream logic was, but it was a very it was very vivid, very very vivid. Hmm. Wow. So yeah. watch your EMP charges, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bryce. <laughs> button up, Bryce. Put that button right on it. <laughs> oh man. Uh, how are you feeling? Good. Good podcast. You feeling ready? It's getting a little hot. It's a little hot out here in uh, in old Oakland. Uh, think think it's that big old TV. Man, it's really it's it's, it's really weird. It, <laughs> it sounds like you're saying something, but I can't hear anything. Um, uh, do not. Yeah, you don't want to. That's measure, that's that's really uh, measure PPs so, with uh, Brian. On is, is your mic muted? Is that what's going on? I because uh, I I just I'm, I'm not hearing anything. I mean, uh, the, here's the thing, man. It's hot out here, and they don't have air conditioning anywhere. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Uh... Oh, actually, okay, you're right. That is that is the the grand sin of California. And, yeah, no, it's and sucks. then they lie to your I, face. It, look, I, I, dude, don't get me wrong. Like I've lived in a hundred plus degree summers for most of uh, my adult life. I'm not saying that it's that we have a weather problem. I'm just saying that a few weeks out of the year, it gets really hot and there's no air conditioning and it sucks. 
And and that's like the benefit of our apartment is that we have these like awesome windows, so we get all this natural light, which is used against us in these uh, these weeks because it just also greenhouses the entire apartment. And those and those freaking ghouls that have the gall to look you in the eye and say, "No, you don't need it. It's fine." And it's like you don't need AC. You got the coastal breeze or whatever. I mean, and look. They're right 90% of the time. You don't really need it all that much, but mm -hmm. there's those couple of weeks. There's that 10% that sucks, yeah. and I'm going to bitch about it. John, uh, our, our new producer, is from L.A., and he just keeps being marveled that central air is everywhere here in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's beginning, I suspect, to understand why. Yeah. <laughs> like, as we, go, as we get into well, the As we keep months. heat torturing him. <laughs> so let me, let me ask you a question then. Like, uh, I mean, I have an AC. I don't have central air, but I'm in an apartment. So I wouldn't have, like, most apartments just a lot of times don't have central air. But a lot of houses in L.A. have central air. Um, he was probably was, in an apartment. I mean, when I lived in apartments in Florida, I didn't have central air. But when I had my townhouse, I had central air. So, I have central air in my place. Nice. Yeah. I, I would say most apartments uh, that I remember in Florida had central air. Yeah. Uh, mm. I mean, I guess maybe what your your one in in Fort Lauderdale maybe didn't, but that was a little. Uh, that was Fort Lauderdale, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was smaller. Yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of little apartment <laughs> units don't like you'll see that in Florida, but like bigger units, whatever, like my townhouse did. But anyhow. Uh, who cares? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Welcome to Property Thoughts. <laughs> With well, Justin Bryant uh, and Andrew. Watch the spelling on that one. Uh... <laughs> well, think about a thermostat. Does you want to make sure? <laughs> oh, man. All right. You on the new show? Yeah. Mm hmm. All right, then. Take it away, Andrew, in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Bron Brushwood. Heck yes. Justin Robert Young. Hey, it's me. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. So, uh, gentlemen, um, I have a, it's not good news. This is sort of depressing kind of news. Oh. Uh, Paul Allen, who was one of the founders of Microsoft, who was a uh, very amazing guy, very, probably a polymath in many, I'm just, just interested in many fields and just a very super talented guy. Um, and was a big advocate for space research and had the company, started the company Strata Launch, which goal was to be, you know, if you looked at like what were the three big private bets on space exploration, you had SpaceX, Blue Origin, and then Strata Launch was another one. And there's, you know, uh, Virgin Space is cool, but, you know, they're not, they weren't, they were involved with like Strata Launch, I believe. And Strata Launch's idea was let's build like the largest airplane in the world and use that to bring rockets to a high altitude, then drop the rocket and let the rocket go on up in space. The pro and con, uh, the pro of that is using a plane to launch gives you access to different orbits than just putting a launch pad on the East Coast or the West Coast. That's one of the advantages of an airplane launch. You can have a faster access to launch because you're not necessarily waiting for the launch pad to be available. There were some advantages to that. And originally, they first announced they were going to work with SpaceX and put, like I think, like a Falcon 5, which when that was going to be a thing on there. And that uh, ended up not happening, but they were still continuing on because there was a role for this to play. And they finally launched the airplane. They got it working. And by the Sadly, way, uh, for, for those who haven't seen the pictures, Google Strato Launch Airplane. It is the coolest, funkiest thing. It's like it's like two 737s uh, uh, holding hands <laughs> in the sky. Yeah, it's amazing. It is. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Well, Paul Allen sadly passed away. And with that uh, was a question of what happens to Strata Launch because he was just kept funding it because it was not you know, revenue positive. And it looks like Strata Launch is going to shut down. Oh, no. Yeah. That's a uh, uh, man. It's like a, it is every bit as ambitious and insane and as crazy a story as the Spruce Goose. Um, what a what a bummer. I, I, I always want the crazy people to, to be proven right, yeah. says the crazy person. Well, yeah. it also just shows you how dependent on these personalities, uh, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of force of will. A lot of this space exploration is like this is definitely like at the the behest of the Paul Allens and Elon Musk's and uh, Jeff Bezos of the world that they want to do this to the point where, you know, as as we are still building the kind of space economy, if it's not uh, if that person isn't there, then. It's just not going to happen. 
Yeah. Now, what's interesting, too, is like, you know, we've talked about SpaceX has their uh, the McGregor facility, right, where they that's where they were doing like the testing, the different um, uh, the grasshopper and all that. And that came about because I forget the name of there was another uh, guy in the 90s who was a big space you know, entrepreneur who invested a lot of money into trying to develop space, you know, you know rockets. And he'd actually built up the infrastructure out there, and then it wasn't able to, you know, see life. You know, was I mean, the company failed, and then SpaceX was able to, I believe, buy that pretty cheap. You know, and so it was sort of uh, well, and was a big help for SpaceX. That's one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, I, I I'm not here to preach for capitalism, but one of the stated benefits of capitalism is that the fa- the 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 failures subsidize the successes, and that was a failed. A, a journey for somebody, but that ended up being instrumental to bring us uh, SpaceX as we know it today. Mm-hmm. So let me see. What was this? Uh, trying to look up the history of that. Um, anyhow, but I mean, yeah, that's the thing is you can certainly you can pick up the assets you pick up there and you move on, as you pointed out. And uh, it's an expensive, expensive Beale Aerospace. That's right. I wanted to give credit to that. And the port, and I guess before that, it was used for the blue bonnet ordinance plant so there was a whole history to that but um you know it's sad but yeah and we'll see hopefully you know there's some amazing technology things like that that strata launch worked on and a lot of great engineers and stuff and people there so i, I feel bad for that you know it was you know somebody always thought was crazy but like you said we we love the crazy sort of approach because it's not that crazy you know so along those same lines about somebody who spent a lot of money and then other people come in and get to spend less money. I guess there's two stories that you just reminded me of. Of One is there's an awful lot of ticked off Tesla owners who blocked off a factory in somewhere in Europe. Did you read about this? No, no. Yeah, they uh, basically, they all paid a certain amount and then there's a big old Model 3 price drop and they're all like, uh, uh, well, hey, we're literally going to block your <laughs> your workers' access to the front by parking our Teslas in the way and making a big stink. Uh, and I, I think uh, from what I read, they, they did have a bit of a point in that they were promised the free upgrades to, mm-hmm. you know, full whatever. And now they're not getting it or or, or they feel like they got screwed because of the, the sudden price drop, um, which – This is the first time that I've seen a backlash because previously I thought that everybody buying a Tesla kind of had it in their mind that what they're doing is they're helping to subsidize a a more carbon neutral future. Oh, no. There's been there's been a number of things because when they've done price drops here, this frustrating. They went for a period where you could say when they first announced it, full self-driving was like was like a seven thousand dollar add on. And then later on, Tesla came out and said, oh, if you want to get it later, if you want to add it now, you can get it for like $3,000 or $2,000. And that caused a bit of an uproar over things. Um, there have been, been, you know, that price moving, whatever, those things like that have there. If you follow on the Reddit forums, there's been a bit of that. Now, I've never seen a public display like this, though. Um, And I would imagine, especially because it feels like an intangible good uh, in mm -hmm. in a way where when you buy an actual electric car, you're like, I'm helping to drive the future. Look at this thing that's made and the infrastructure to do it. But then it feel, you know, if it feels more like you're, 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 you know, it's like, look, you guys have it. Just let me have it. Just let me press the button and have Mm -hmm. the upgrade. Why are you making me pay? So I have a friend that he paid for full self-driving when he bought his. And I said, you know, I'm going to wait for full self-driving to be closer to coming out. And then they did a thing where they they offered it at like like two thousand or something like that. I'm like, all right, I'll buy it. So then I bought it. So I paid like three or four thousand dollars less than my friend, who to his credit was had your attitude was an early adopter. Let me support them and help develop this. And I have that attitude to an extent. But when the owner of the company, who I admire, but has like three mansions in Bel Air, I don't think it's really necessary for me to look upon him as a charity case. Uh, And my friend was bothered, but then they offered them like, hey, you're going to get early access to some features and stuff to kind of ameliorate that. And so he gets stuff before I do with that. So, uh, yeah, here's my thing. Can I just say this thing? Whenever somebody wants to protest by blocking a thing, like blocking entrances or highways or stuff, you lose my sympathy. I'm now against you. (laughs) Pretty much universally, huh? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, there's there's like the – 
you know, not in this case, but sometimes it's like, ah, oh, taxi workers upset with Uber. They're going to shut down the streets in the city. It's almost like Uber's like, hey, how can we make people hate taxi drivers more? Okay, <laughs> we'll pay a guy to pretend to tax be a taxi driver. He's going to show up in the meeting and go, you know what we need to do? Let's inconvenience everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it is an interesting thing because – I think the idea behind stuff like that is that protests are only X effective, right? Uh, and and it's an interesting way to say like, okay, well, we'll make sure everybody has to hear our message by being that level of of disruptive. But I'm kind of with you. Like, at the end of the day, the the protest is going to get out the word. Uh, you would hope that it also does not damage your cause. On well, some- yeah, that just did. It's like like. You know, if if it's who are you, it's it's whoever you're inconveniencing is the thing. And if it's like, well, a bunch of Uber drivers shutting down the middle of the city, like, well, you're inconveniencing everybody except for Uber, you know, the people who, you know, and like here, shutting down the entrance, like, all right, like, one, I, I have a problem with that is kind of a form of hostage taking. But it's also like, these are the workers trying to get in out of there. You know, it's, it's not affecting Elon, you know? Yeah. I mean, I guess, and, and, uh, uh, uh Bryce uh, taking to the chat with his uh, we need more convenient protest take. Uh, I, I I think all protests are PR, right? Like on some level you are trying to get the word out. So everything has to, uh, you know, you would, you would hope that by the end of the protest, more people are aware and sympathetic to your cause. And, you know, I think it, it's an interesting thing. It, it is, it is an interesting question. Well, it, it, the sympathy is a thing. And I, I, it's not a matter. It's, Think carefully who you're inconveniencing. You know, you know, you want to inconvenience the people you want to cause the change, not the people you want to on your side. But so I know. got a, uh, uh, I got, I got a second story in the same vein. Only mm-hmm. this one seems to be a, uh, a positive spin. Saw so a Reddit top thread that says, uh, "quote NASA is opening the space station to thirty five thousand dollar a night visits." A tourist who paid Russia thirty million to get there a decade ago says it's quote a seismic shift. Well, who do that... you suppose was that tourist? Oh, uh, Dennis Tito. No. Um... No, it was our friend Richard Garriott, uh, and and Richard Garriott had to give his seat to Tito to go first, and then Garriott went. Uh, uh, correct, but 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 it's funny to me that in the headline they did not yeah. use his name, but rather referred to him as a a tourist who paid yeah, Russia. Uh, it's, <laughs> Even uh, though, like, he's co-founder of Space Adventures, and and, and, he, and I mean, it's I don't know, so remarkable. Yeah. Now, just to be clear, that's the cost. To be on the station, you still have to pay for your trip to the station. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But yeah, um, yeah. I think it's. I think we should be doing this. I think that I'd be more. I, I'm. I'm always more excited if we get more research institutions and stuff looking at the idea of doing this. You know, putting more scientists up there, et cetera. That's what excites me. But um, yeah, space station's expensive. Well, uh, and specifically, uh, I think Richard in this article was talking about how. Previously, he he had multiple NASA officials try to talk him out of the trip and and multiple regulatory things changed just to block him from going. And um, I, 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 I man, we should we should get him on weird things and, and do yeah. a quick talk about that. That would be that would be fun. Yeah, he yeah, he went through a lot. You know, we we did a segment on him when we did our G4 series. And then there's a documentary on him, too, about this. And you, Brian, knows him really well. And. You know, you hear about like when we talk about the parochial nature of like NASA, it can be frustrating because there are a lot of wonderful people working there who are very much into space, promo, you know, promoting for everybody. And there are people there who think, no, it's our thing. This is our our territory. And, you know, you get a guy like, you know, Richard Garriott, a super enthusiast for space, develops, you know, the company to help do space tourism and help fund space research to help fund, you know, give money to Russia and the United States space programs and stuff and treat it like, you know, he's crashing some sort of party when, you know, NASA has no problem putting, you know, almost octogenarian senators and Saudi princes on board space shuttle flights because politically it's expedient. It's just drives me nuts, drives me nuts. Uh, well, so how do you feel about the general decision to name a specific price and to say essentially open for business? I, great first step. I, the 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 you want to put a number on something. 
Uh, I think that I've made it clear. Obviously, I'm less excited about space tourism as I am about, you know, getting some really cool researchers from, you know, Johns Hopkins University working on some sort of stem cell research or something like that up there. But cool. I think it's awesome. Man, what? Ha- well, how how what do long think, do you think that Yelp review is going to be like? <laughs> what's What's funny is I was just thinking like if we're going to place a bet in time, before how long until we have something happen that the media ends up dubbing the first space crime, and we have an incident, some people get into a fist fight or and or or there's an assault or, um, you, you know. Maybe it will happen, but that right now stuff is so locked down. So much stuff has happened that you have to talk to inside NASA people to hear about the thing that happened because they put – the space station is a $100, million, $100 billion project, right? And it takes billions of dollars every year to do that, and NASA does not want somebody to go in front of a Senate hearing and say, well, what about when this happened or what about this happened? And so – they, you know, they go out of their way. They have an imme- immense ability to sort of change or mute things that happen. So uh, we'll so, see. So, like, hey, so they, yeah, this know. sounds to me, reading between the lines, that there has already been a space crime, and they have very effectively oh, kept it quiet. <laughs> you know, the we've talked about this before. That the it wasn't a mutiny, Skylab mutiny kind of thing. You know, that was going back to then when you had you know you guys, the astronauts in the Skylab, who said, "Hey, we're working too much, whatever." We're going to take a little time off and you get conflicting accounts like, oh, that wasn't what happened. It wasn't this. You read the transcripts. You look at this like, I don't know. This maybe sound a little bit more. You had the Apollo astronauts, the whole postage stamp scandal. You know, they brought stamps to the moon and brought them back to sell them for tens of thousands of dollars. <gasps> um, I didn't hear about that. that. Big... That's amazing. Yeah. And so there's been a lot of these things that just, you know, kind of just sort of go away. You know, and then, you know, so. Well, because ultimately it, it doesn't really benefit anybody who is in position to confirm it, to make a big deal about it. Yeah. And that is, I think, to your point, Brian, that now that we're like just putting randos up there, then it's like, all right, well, maybe if some dude's a total doucher, <laughs> like it will, will, will people say like, yeah, he's awful and we need to never have him back in space again. There was a shuttle incident, and again, I don't know how much is true or not, but a uh, shuttle astronaut, a researcher who had spent years working on a project to bring it up on the shuttle, brought it up, and it failed immediately. And the story is they basically had to put them on suicide watch. (gasps) Wow. Because they were afraid this person, like, this person just went, like, bliss, because it was the one thing they went there to go do. You know, like, maybe true, maybe not, but something to it but we don't know much about it because man true tales from space i can't wait until uh, everything's uh, so much more frequent that we can actually just dive into uh you know, some, some of those stories in in, in, in fullness i'm wondering there are stories that there's audio of the challenger accident <gasps> oh, holy smokes Oh my goodness! Whoa, that would be amazing. No, nope. bad. You should, under freedom information should be accessible, but I've talked to people at NASA who say that it's legit and that it was that that did they were alive a lot longer than we said. Yeah. Oh my God. The uh, maybe true, maybe not true, but because there's, you know, I, I I assume that this has to have happened, but nobody's made a fuss about it yet. But like a space groping incident like some somebody <laughs> like oh oh i'm just uh, I'm trying to squeeze through there's gotta be i mean when you're up there any kind even if you're like a, a, of the utmost professionalism like people gotta hate each other people gotta be you know uh all all the things that come along with what would happen on a submarine right like just uh, uh, multiply it uh, even more we uh, talked about the astronaut uh, couple that like were secretly married or whatever. Yeah, they they got married like the day before they went up in the space shuttle, and uh, officially nothing happened. Mm, that seems likely. Right out of there, the the romance <laughs> textbook with Ted Bundy's courtroom marriage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good for them. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's, it, but back to Brian, your earlier question, how, it, it's going to happen. Because, I mean, the, you know, the more in this age, the more stuff that goes on there and the more people go up there and whatnot, we're going to get, you know. So w- would you take the over or the under on, let's say, four years? 
What do you mean by space crime? Though? Well, what I mean is a a a, a press flap, like a, because I'm I'm certain some kind of inappropriate you're, space you're, crime. You're thinking has... more space scandal. Yeah, there like, we go. Space like, scandal. Space, there you go. Space crime. I think yeah, there needs to be an authority that's like issuing a ticket or something. But you're you you mean like. Uh, sh shocking new details from space scandal broke. Yeah, and I guess I guess I'm also thinking about like uh, of a level where they have to figure out whose jurisdiction it is because it's an international effort and it's not on the planet. So if something is a crime in one area and not in another, you know, uh, well, if you're if you're like the moment this happens. You know, I'm Kim Kardashian's publicist saying we got to get you and Kanye up there for a honeymoon and have another baby, a space baby. Right. Yeah. You know, you know, that's that's the level. And, and once you get to that level, who knows what can happen? You know? Yeah. Brian, are you thinking maybe it's like a civil lawsuit from an incident that began in space, like something that would be like kind of mundane, but you know, it would, would leave tongues wagging. Yeah, I guess I guess the best thing to look at is the kind of things that happen on cruise ships and yeah. and how soon we'll have one of those and how soon it'll be, uh, like like you said, Justin, a space scandal. I, I feel like less than four years. I think it'll be sooner than that. I have some information on this. Uh-oh, what you got? <laughs> this uh, originally was answered by uh, NASA space engineer and instructor Robert Frost. Uh, regarding if you commit crime in space. Yes. Uh, with regard to criminal conduct, uh, part of the uh, Outer Space Treaty of 1967, it states Canada, the, U the European partner states, Japan, Russia, and the United States may exercise criminal jurisdiction over personnel in or on any flight element who are their respective nationals. So I think that they treat people the way that they treat objects that are sent into space, which is that the, they belong to the country. They are the responsibility of the country who sends them up, yeah. Oh, but what happens like in a space groping where it's a crime in one country and not the other? Um, uh, I, in a I case guess, involving misconduct in no, orbit... You, you that just affects, grope a Stanian here, here official. Uh, is, misconduct that affects the life or safety of a national of another partner state or occurs in or on or causes damage to the flight element of another partner state, the partner state whose national is the alleged perpetrator shall, at the request of any affected partner state, consult with such state concerning their respective prosecutorial interests. So I guess it goes, uh, I guess the nationality of the victim is what matters more. Yeah, because then the affected state could say, hey, we need to figure out what to do here. Right. Huh. And we can get into, too, like, if a groping, are you crossing a territorial line? I, 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 man, we we are out of my jurisdiction for sure, and now yeah, that's well because the groping that that would be like a sexual harassment lawsuit, right? I mean that th mm -hmm. this would be something that like oh well you I don't know did if somebody goes up there and gropes the space maid or something like <laughs> the that. space maid <laughs> like then that would be like a civil lawsuit. I mean I guess you might you might bring uh, uh, charges right. Can be criminal too, Justin. It could be. What about what? Oh, what about space libel or space slander? <laughs> Where you're up there and you're just you're just lying your face off and ruining the stock market. <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> space slander. <laughs> you're just saying all sorts of wild stuff that you just know it's like I'm I'm willfully damaging this person's <laughs> you know reputation. Oh my God, Elon oh, you know, Musk like, could make people... illegal space tweets. <laughs> People, people kicked off of like YouTube and Twitter. You know, they they start a space station, yeah. <laughs> pranking my friend over on the Russian arm. Let's go. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you can't deplatform me now, can you? <laughs> <laughs> Broadcast on ham radio station one double oh nine seven. This is this is info pla prison planet. That's what you are, <laughs> slaves to gravity down there. George W. Bush is a deep state plant. <laughs> You know, uh, if you want to make sure we're not deplatformed, we could use your help. <laughs> Heck yeah. yeah, man. Head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash weird things. Not only can you support this little show, you can also uh, uh, get our After Things program, which is uh, well, the show that we do after weird things where we talk about entrepreneurship and all sorts of other fun stuff. Before anyone else, get your custom RSS feed. All you got to do is head on over there right now, patreon.com slash weird things. 
Gentlemen, I've got a heartwarming story for you. <laughs> you know what usually follows that? A very heartwarming story. Yeah. But actually, it is. So I'm going to talk about a guy named James. James worked on the railroad in South Africa, okay? And uh, he used to jump between rail cars to try to do his duties, etc. And then one day, James fell and lost a leg. Mm. Okay. Now, guy is an amputee, and all of a sudden, what is he supposed to do? Double leg amputee. Double leg amputee who wants to work on the railroad. Now, he's able to get, like, and this is back in the day. This is, we're talking, like, 100 years ago. So he's able to get, uh, I mean, more than 100 years. We're talking, like, 140 years ago. So he's able to get, like, you know, like, the wooden sort of the, the state-of-the-art thing then, which is, like, oak peg legs or whatever. But he doesn't. He was a signalman. Doesn't want to doesn't quit. Doesn't want to lose his job. He needs help. He needs help. He needs loyal, loyal help to help him work on the railroad. Yeah, maybe so some, does does he get a, a service animal to, to help him out? He does. He does. But what service animal would you use? Oh. So this is a double amputee wants to get around. Also, we do the Weird Things podcast. So I'm going to say a burrow is out. A horse is out. I feel like there's less mass to carry around. So maybe <laughs> this is, you probably want a smart creature and I'm going to put this out here. I'm going to say he got a service hog that he rides around. <laughs> no, remember he's got to work on the rail. Oh, on the... so he's still working on the railway. He's got to switch signals and stuff or get them switched. Oh, what does that mean to work on a railway? What's his job entail? So you have a railroad, like going between cars, hopping off the train, hopping back on the train, or getting oh, on and off the train. Yeah. A oh, goblin? I, I feel, hold on. I feel like that was a pre <laughs> pretty big clue that we just got. That you want something that will hop up on the train and hop off the train. Oh, my God. Is this, does this dude have... <laughs> Is this dude riding a kangaroo around? No, fixing no he's not riding the animal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he's in the pouch. Although the animal would push him in his wheelchair. <gasps> Wait, what? Oh. A little, a little monkey? Little? I mean, a big old <gasps> monkey. How about a chocolate baboon? Jack what? the baboon worked on the rail helping out James Wide. Oh, Apparently, I the baboon was paid 20 cents a day and a half a bottle of beer each week. Oh my God! So he, he worked for the railway for nine years, assisting James White. We got a there photo! Go. Oh my God! Look oh at that God, baboon! Baboon! <laughs> and look, look at James and his wooden legs. He's got little di little dinner table legs. Dude, this is a good. This is like a throwback wow. Thursday, like photo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this uh, I would what this this needs to be a movie. This I would yeah. watch the hell out of this movie. So apparently every now and then people would be on the train and they would complain like, I just saw a baboon go out there and throw the signal switch. <laughs> <laughs> and he would barely, the baboon would go out and go, oh, switch, switch for the train. Oh, that is and they said he never made a mistake in nine years. <laughs> wow. Wait, all right, hold on. He got paid 12 cents in a bottle of beer. Like, where did he put the money? <laughs> like, did he open a bank account? Uh, I mean, he probably just spit it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my uh, gosh! Apparently, he was extremely. Uh, yeah, the driver. Each time one of the drivers would give a signal, Jack would change the signal without once making an error. Um, you know, so apparently, you know, uh, you know, I. This I, is like the cats. This is like the cats that they do at those railway way stations in japan except they've employed this monkey uh, <laughs> instead what, of just what, having mascots what, what's the cat thing the cat thing is just a mascot uh yeah so they're like cats who live at the station and they are they're like mascots and the station master quote unquote ah. and so they live there but this it sounds like they also <laughs> used jack to operate the railroad well and so and... jack would operate the railroad they said he would sweep up the kitchen floor he would remove trash and they said he was also worked as night watchman. So anybody who'd imagine sneaking into the railroad, oh, let's go into the telegraph office. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I can see, I could see this working as a partnership thing because you don't need to, uh, 
you know, like when you have a dog who's who's really loyal, like they're 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 looking at you for permission for everything, and then and you could say like yes, no, and it's like they kind of get it. So it's like if he understood the tasks. I mean, obviously, I, I don't think the baboon can work fully autonomously, but if basically he's working for the approval of of our double amputee hero, then then really all he's got to do is, you know, like this one and, 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 you know, shake his head. No, this one. Yes, yes, yes. And then so it, 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 I mean, I totally see, could see this working. That's remarkable. Well, apparently they look at like they could. Uh, I guess. Let me see, read this. Um, fearing. Oh, here. All right. Fearing for her safety, this is what a woman reported in her fellow to at her fellow patches. Incidents reported authorities in Cape Town who at first could not believe her story that they didn't realize that this baboon is being used. The system manager and a delegation that consists of inspected visited the station and Jumper Wide and Jack were dismissed from duty. Again, Wide pleaded, unfortunately, or maybe a case of curiosity, forced the system manager to the test of the ability of Jack. A locomotive driver were given secret instructions and all present waited to see if Jack would pass the strenuous touch. Test each time that the driver blasted a different signal, Jack would change the correct signal in points without fail. Jack even looked around in a different direction of oncoming trains to make sure that the correct lever and signal were changed. Jack passed the test with flying colors, and he and his boss were duly employed by authorities, and from that day on became known as Jack the Signalman. That's so great. Not only did he get his monthly rations from the government, but he also received an employee number. Oh, that's great. I mean that's the movie, right? The movie yeah. is that's that's your ending. Yeah, it's, that it's you got you got somebody like everyone knows that baboons could never switch train tracks. I believe you. <laughs> it's it's basically the uh, Ghostbusters. It's Peck from the Ghostbusters. Exactly. <laughs> Where it's like this is a fraud. That's the big moment at the end. Is he is he passes it and he gets his own uh, he gets his job and it's maybe in the movie version we'll give him a uniform like he gets yeah. his little name tag and everything. It ends with him with him with everybody clapping and cheering and the, the baboon holds up his employee ID card and goes Aah! roll credits. Yeah, it's uh, it. more more photos here. We're looking at the baboon pulling the signal. That's amazing. That is one of the best stories I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> and and somebody brought this up. It does make you wonder how many other human jobs could be replaced by monkey labor. Yeah. Uh, well, all we got to do is put you know monkeys in giant you know uh, robot bodies, and uh, and then they'll they'll be in charge of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. You're fine, Bryce. You're fine. <laughs> Without fail, he would switch the cameras on command. He could detect I mean, the lulling conversation. Like, <laughs> you, you finish the podcast though, and it's done flawlessly. Then he he walks up and he hands you like like you know your your phone with some notes he made for you though, and he's got some crits. <laughs> <laughs> Segment two on too long. <laughs> Who self-deprecating act three? <laughs> like, oh, <geez. laughs> anyway, Twitter account, not enough posts, need right. more engagement. All right, don't make it real. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I got another story for you here. Uh, let's just, this, I want to do a little, 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 let's see the future thing. So, it's 2019, and uh, E3 is going on. Yeah, um, I watched a little bit of that. I watched actually a little bit of the uh, the uh, the Google Stadia announcement um, before, which was interesting. Uh, you know, because like you know, the future of gaming. Hot take here, guys. Gaming's only going to get bigger. Whoa. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, I was thinking, it's like, man, like you know, the graphics now these things are super, super amazing they're amazing you know the thing that's only missing now is just more nuance and stuff to performance capture etc but it's incredible you know you watch these things and it's like what's what's e3 going to be like in 2029 uh I, 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 let me let me make this uh bold hot take um lots of free swag being given away uh, <laughs> lots of uh, uh, st streams that go too long. Lots of people who are not accustomed to being in front of the camera, clumsily saying their lines on camera. Well, what else? Uh, oh, but that was great this year. You didn't see the Keanu thing. The Keanu thing was very good this oh, year. Oh, yeah, he did yeah, exactly that. So, so, oh, really? Yeah. 
they, they're putting him in cyberpunk and well yeah but but they, but like he came out and did a they've a, trotted him out on stage and, and, and he, he did was, a bad delivery like it, everybody no, else does he was deliver. charming he was great and probably drunk and I <laughs> <it>. <laughs> oh dude this sounds like a night attack breakdown i'm gonna we'll have to take a look yeah, at this tomorrow, we'll that tomorrow. Oh, it was it was great because it's like john wick has done so much wonders for keanu because now it's this Hey, we all like this guy. Ah, I wish he had something relevant. Oh, we like this guy, and now he's got this super relevant, cool series, John Wick. You know. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah. But uh, yeah, that was just a fun. And, and you look at that, where like, you know, a scope of a game can bring out one of the and now back to one of the top box office stars in the world, and that's the thing. You know, like, oh, well, you know, we'll drop who knows how many, you know, tens of millions of dollars to get. We'll get Keanu Reeves in our game because you know. Games are bigger than box office movies now. Yeah, by a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Man, maybe he he might be a little drunk. <laughs> that was a bit of he a was. stumble. <laughs> he was. No, it was good. That's the swoop heard around the world. <laughs> <laughs> he swoops his hand, and and you almost like first of all, it's an exaggerated swoop, and you think like, well, maybe he's not. And then you see the stumble, double tap on the foot to steady himself. <laughs> <laughs> But it was you got to watch because he came out there. They loved him. He loved them. It was a fun, you know, yeah. you know, fun exchange. And then also it's like, you know, just the the scale. And it's one of these things. And I've said that the problem with gaming is that you have a certain part of the population which is huge into gaming, and you're aware of how big it is. And the other part of the population is like, yeah, I guess it's a thing. And yeah, then, yeah. Well, and a lot of that is being. Uh, being met by the mobile gaming market, and you're mm -hmm. seeing more more growth there. Certainly not at an E3 type stage, but even even then, you know, Bethesda had their announcement last night, and a bunch of the stuff they were talking about was mobile only games. You know, their mm -hmm. their card game is on mobile. They have an Elder Scrolls game on mobile. They're bringing back Commander Commander Kid. Did Commander I Keen. Commander Keen. They're re they're making a new Commander Keen on mobile. Um, and so I think the publishers are, are becoming more aware that, that mobile is a thing. But with, with the free-to-play model, a lot of the big names aren't, aren't uh, maybe don't see eye-to-eye -eye with that business model yet. Oh, speaking of, uh, of free-to-play models, uh, uh, man, I, I tweeted it out. But if you guys haven't seen it, um, this, this takedown of the Game of Thrones officially licensed browser game, uh, it's, it's like 20 minutes long, and it is – so good uh the, the i'm not normally a fan of just 20 minutes of of crapping on other people's art but when you see the depths of phoning it in that they do and the <laughs> obvious spelling errors and the fact that it's clearly just a, a country you know a, a chinese uh, sure. uh click i mean farm that's thing. what a lot of these games are is they're just reskins of existing games so that they can put Final Fantasy or Game of Thrones on it. Um, uh, yeah. It, it, what, it, what's great about what I liked about this in particular is that he spent hours and hours giving it the old college try. Like sure. he really <laughs> tried to treat it as a game and just it, it, it came back with literally unplayable. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's yeah, it's interesting because you have that. We'll just buy that property and you know skin it onto something else and then you get other other sides of it like justin Royland launched uh his game i forget what was the title of it uh trevor oh, trevor, trevor saves, saves the universe. world or something like that. universe yeah and like and that's interesting because like this is how many Royland seems to be pretty involved in the games he's worked on and and the idea of the super producer kind of creative guy who comes from one genre to another and you know it's fascinating sure. you know it's like you know kind of a very interesting thing to see what happens there how are the reviews on trevor saves the universe I don't know. Uh, I think it's freshly new, so I, I haven't heard too much about it. But uh, he's got his own company. He's got that Squanch Tendo. I, I think company, they changed so he... the name to Squanch Games. I wonder why they would change their name. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> but mm. uh, yeah, and it's interesting also if, in terms of like what gaming's going to be in ten years. Like the uh, bespoke. Uh, uh, publisher as uh like a a, a curator um is something that's picking up a lot of traction now with uh devolver always kind of being like a a de facto seal of quality on certain games 
uh, Annapurna is is in a similar yeah, state? I'd say for the most part, Blizzard has maintained that. Uh, it, it is wild because there was a time that the publisher just flat out equaled the best games. Like, you know, all the way back in the Atari days, sure. Activision equals vastly superior to anything else you were going to get on the Atari. Because they had, they had the most the most money, and, and it was expensive to make games. Right, and they, they also were the first publisher, I believe, to allow creators to put their names on it and uh, mm -hmm. and, and actually get acknowledged. Yeah. Um, they, uh, uh, they, but nowadays, you know, obviously Activision means something very different. Uh, although, although the Blizzard part, because I guess Activision bought Blizzard, mm -hmm. uh, Blizzard has maintained that uh, that seal of quality. Yeah, that's it's an interesting thing is you know you look at the games industry as a whole and how you know, we have more data now to try to figure out like how what makes a successful game company versus not. You know, the ones that have the hit and try to double down on that hit, and then you see the protracted development schedules running out of money, and there's like this the pattern you can see to where the ones that fail versus the ones you point out that say, Well, we're gonna have we're gonna have a few different titles, you know, like a studio, like a movie studio that's gonna say, We're not just gonna do one movie a year and make it a big franchise thing because if it fails, we're doomed. Mm -hmm. Um and figuring out how to manage that, you know. Yeah. Um but you know, then indie developers, so there's a lot of, still I think there's mm -hmm more chances now for indies than there were before more platforms yeah you know it's it's exciting uh the um, big the big talk this year uh maybe you get a temperature check on on the three of you guys the big talk has been the streaming services not just stadia but also mm -hmm. xcloud and uh, a few weeks ago sony and microsoft had a memo of cooperation that they will probably be teaming up on whatever sony's new version of playstation now will be uh, not to mention Bethesda, one of the other things Bethesda talked about last night was they are, it was very weird for them to talk about it. They are building this middleware called Orion that developers mm. can put into their games to optimize them for uh, for, for game streaming. Uh, so reducing the amount of data that it takes to get a, an image out, they're reducing latency. Um, it was weird for them to put that on their consumer briefing, but uh, it's a sign that kind of everyone is really taking game streaming into consideration. What do you guys feel about that? Well, so let me, because like the, the Stadia thing, I'm like, oh, Google getting this is interesting. So let me go pay attention to this. And like, and so st Google Stadia basically, it's a service. You pay them a fee, and then you use your 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 Chromecast Ultra or your PC or your phone, and then you have a controller. You can, you know, your controller connects with it. So the idea is that their servers are the ones serving the game to you. Which, if you're Google, is a very Google way to do this. But then you get into the specs, and you see that like, oh, they're saying, oh, we're going to do 4K. I'm like, well. 4k streaming sounds great i went to go use the tool like the download tool like the speed test tool to see if you know what your speed will work for you the download tool the speed test tool didn't work oh really <laughs> so i'm like well that's a little bit of a fail right there because you're like ah, i want to do four i don't need a box i'll do 4k streaming games on my mm -hmm. computer here and then it's like um Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Uh, we're checking the connection right now. Yeah. Um, yours looks like it's going to work. And this is a fiber uh, I have connection, good download, so. but horrible upload. You know, I don't know what my latencies are. So, I think that's a thing where you know where Microsoft's like, hey, yeah, no, we're gonna we're gonna put out an 8K box, you know, um, versus you know what's going on with yeah. Ixo RN in the chat says playing via stream will will fall hard because of uh, crummy infrastructure around the world. Um, I I think that on this very program we've talked about why that will cease to be true in a matter of as few as four or five years. I mean, once once we get enough satellites, <clears throat> it's uh, all these low orbit sal satellites and a giant mesh network. Um, it's a uh, uh, we, we've talked about the book Bold by uh, Peter Diamandis, and he says that the right strategy is to build your uh, to notice trends and then build your company, assuming that if something is trending down, it eventually becomes free. So, so Google was founded on the idea that uh, that eventually storage will be uh, free, and so and sure enough, they kept on buying used hard drives, and they were able to build uh, and, and jump ahead. And likewise, um, you know, bandwidth streaming services. Netflix built their company based on the idea that eventually everyone will have plenty of streaming capability and uh, whether or not we're there today we'll be there essentially in 20 minutes with 5g across most of the country and then but within but, five years all around the world but, but, but it's not about getting it's not necessarily about the last mile it's also your distance to just the google data center co correct but 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 specifically the uh uh with the is it starlink is that what it's called the the elon musk thing right uh, i i believe that will be even uh shorter uh, 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 uh latency than than what most of us have right now it'll be, be faster than fiber yeah faster than fiber 
Well, I think the but, but this has been a bet for Google forever, and and they I think have a, a, at times been a lesser company for it. That they have always they have bet on the idea that universal connectivity uh, will make a lot of things obsolete, and it's because of that. You know, they they initially wanted Chrome to be an operating system. They did not look at it as just a browser because they believed that. Uh, you would only ever need to download things, uh, or not download, just to, to stream them off the internet because that was their idea. And you know, I think that they really missed uh, they missed the boat on a couple different uh, things, uh, up to and including storage, uh, which would should have been a natural uh, uh, fit for them. Uh, and the question here is like, okay, well, are they right now? Are, are are they right for this? Are they right for gaming? And I think that there's it's like some very clever stuff. Where you know your controller, your Stadia controller is the thing that's connecting directly to uh, you know their servers, basically. Right. Uh, so so that should like reduce latency. But uh, I don't know. To me, it, it is a bold strategy to put some of the most loathed companies in between uh, you and your customer. And if you are relying on streaming, then you are putting Comcast, AT and T, and Spectrum in between. Yeah, I'm real curious because I mean Google, as I say the trying to stream you know playing two or three hours of a game and trying to do it at 4k and to have that push through you know comcast or spectrum whatever they're gonna they're gonna probably have a new tier or something you know because of that mm -hmm. because also like a big part of what netflix does is netflix has a lot of their movies located you know co-located near you which i guess google's doing the same with their gaming servers and stuff so it certainly is it leverages what google can do well but yeah i'm i i think eventually we'll have great connections but you know when your 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 competition is hey it's a three hundred dollar box that always works you know in theory yeah and it's uh you know we're we're about a year out from the new xboxes and playstations uh, uh xbox was unveiled their code name that we already knew the code name for their next uh box which is scarlet uh and they're you know they didn't say anything other than like we're going to put an SSD in it. It's going to be faster. We're going to reduce load times, going to do higher resolutions, higher frame rates, which I think will be a, a big thing considering people just want consistent or good frame rates. Um, mm. But I, I think because because the hardware is becoming more commoditized and because like rate har, hardware ray tracing is becoming um, mm -hmm. sort of the next big step in, in terms of graphic um, graphic evolution, um, I think you're going to continue to see a pretty traditional offering in that camp for just playing at home on a box. And that's probably what people want, right? I mean, you look at Nintendo going from the Wii to the Wii U, which was going even crazier, and then to the Switch, which was much more traditional, um, and the, the huge response from, from people even today. I guess, this, the, the, I guess really the upsell on the Stadia is the idea that I can play the same game on my tablet, I can play the same game everywhere, you know sure. that that the the box is the thing I have to use at home if I want to do a different version that I got to go buy a new piece of hardware or a different thing. So I guess that's the appeal of the Stadia is that. Though, uh, yeah, I mean they're they're saying it's on one device, instant access. You know, not have to do an upload, updates, and and downloads and stuff. Though with like um, I I I I think both of the the Xbox and the PlayStation have um, uh, in home streaming. So, uh, Steam has a similar thing on on the PC where you can turn on your computer and hook up your what? TV. That's the thing is the, the, the turn on your computer part where if I'm away from home or whatever, and I want to play the game or pick up the game or not do that, you know? Sure. Oh, um, wow. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's the upside of Stadia. Stadia is like, oh, I got my phone. I got the game here right now, you know? Yeah. And, and we don't know a lot about the X, the coming X cloud service. Mm -hmm. It does sound like they, they were hinting that you could use your console as a server in that way. Um, but it's we don't have details on that stuff yet. So yeah. Well, want to jump into picks? Yeah. yeah. Hey, I got a pick. I don't know if any of you guys will, is, is necessarily up your alley, but uh, there's a very funny web series that I got into over the weekend and uh, into some of their back episodes. It's called Game of Zones. It's produced by Bleacher Report, uh, and it's very well done animation of uh, NBA drama and and plot lines as uh, uh reenacted in a game of thrones s universe but it's a lot of funny just in jokes about uh you know nba stuff uh mixed with a lot of funny in jokes and game of thrones uh, uh you know if you don't 
if you're not into both, I don't know how much uh, it'll matter. <laughs> but uh, uh, if you are into both, then you're going to enjoy it. Very cool. That's on YouTube. Cool. Yeah. YouTube.com. <laughs> uh, hot damn did I fall instantly in love with Good Omens. I mm-hmm. am almost done with the third episode. I watched the first episode twice uh, because I enjoyed it so much and I wanted to watch it again with my wife. Just the first 10 minutes will have you... Either, if, if you're not already in love by the end of the first 10 minutes, then clearly uh, you're you're not a human being and, wow. uh, and it's not going to take. But I think that you will be in love by the end of the first 10 minutes. It reminded me of everything that... That that so many people love about um, you know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, the, the the cast is all star. The direction, the the aesthetic, it's it takes a very heavy subject, uh, Armageddon, and makes it so adorably whimsical. Uh, it's just uh, it's wonderful. It's it, that fusion is is delightful beyond words. Loved it. Yeah. No. I... It's a very particular type of humor, I think. It's a little try-hardy for me. Oh, really? Little. Uh, I little. I finished it over the weekend. I I really liked that thing, and I'd like to see I, more of that thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the two leads are fantastic sure. in in Michael different Sheen. ways. I, I love I love the cast, um, and I think that it's it's the show that um, when it's going, I like it. When it's when it's Giving me all the, you know, razzle dazzle. I'm, uh, I don't know. I, I, I found myself kind of being brought out of connecting to the characters. But, hmm. Hmm. Great. Uh, I have a pick. I, I watched uh, a new movie on Netflix. Oh wait, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna not pick this because I have mediocre things to say about it. Black Mirror is back, everybody. Yay! Black Mirror is back, and Black Mirror is, is pretty cool. They got three new episodes. Are they good? Uh, they are pretty good. They are. Uh, I'll tell you this: uh, light on science fiction uh, this this year on Black Mirror. But uh, that also means that they kind of try to tell a little bit of a different different types of stories. I mean, um, I think I think Charlie Brooker was out there saying that uh, one of them, the Smithereens episode, uh, when he wrote it, he wanted to do a story that had no science fiction. Uh, that was just a modern contemporary technology story, but is not futuristic or 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 uh but I, I think it's cool the miley cyrus episode i'm i'm still very impressed with she's she does a very good job in in being a uh pop star who wants to you know she wants to be more than just a pop star but then the machine around her has things and it's actually the that one i don't remember the exact name of it but uh it feels a lot like a disney channel movie honestly and it's it's like over an hour so because it's a, it's about both her as a pop star, but also these two teen girls, and they they cross paths and and save the day. Um, very good. And then Striking Vipers, the other one is uh, was surprising. Um, I think that was a very cool thing that they do. So uh, Black Mirror. I watched that last night. It's, that was a that was a, a little surprising, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, I. I what I liked about Black Mirror was I always liked that Black Mirror always had, hey, here's the setup. Now we're going to have this really cool twist. We're going to change what this universe actually means or whatever like that. Sure. And, These don't have that. But I'd be splendid if I tell you, don't worry. That won't happen here. <laughs> You're yeah. just going to get a, a mm-hmm. Hallmark Channel kind of, I don't know, uh, kind of thing. Like, uh, but it, it's there's like my favorite line in there is the, you know, the I even effed a blank. Oh, yes. <laughs> This... I said, I said, this made the whole episode worth it. This made the episode worth it. So uh, that it's, it's... It, it it really the this season, and I think even if you look at last season, is a lot less bleak and kind of fill fill like despair filled. Um, I I think they're they're really rounding the edges on on some of that stuff. Yeah. But I think that means that they're opening up to some different uh the sort of endings. It doesn't have to always be the worst you know, make you cry, bad ending. Yeah, no, they've tried to, he, Booker said that he wanted to make him maybe less nihilistic and, you know, because, yeah. you don't know, what was the one, the one with Bryce Dallas Howard that just, like, I couldn't even oh, finish. No. It was just too depressing. Uh, that one has a, that one has a, 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 a ray of hope at the end, though. 
I could, I, I'll have to take a run on that one. <laughs> 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 so, uh, anybody else? Anyone else? I think it's you. It's me. It's me. All right. It's me. Um, I'm going to give you an update. So I've been with the Oculus Quest for over a week now. Ooh. How do you like it? I pick it up every day and use it, which wow. for me in a video game or any kind of platform uh, is a lot. I've got several of my friends have now gone out and got them, you know, either based upon my enthusiasm or having played them and all that. Um, the Quest has been selling out everywhere, and it's prob I mean, it looks like it's on track to become like one of the biggest VR platforms there is now. We'll see. Um, but it's as far as user base, how enthusiasm for it. I love it. I absolutely love it. Hardware's been great. I've been having a lot of fun. You know, surprisingly, like Tilt Brush has been like my my favorite thing in it. Um, but you know, for you gamer types, there's you know a lot of fun st stuff you're familiar with. You've already on VR, but just the portability of it, just not having to turn on your computer or hook up cables or whatever, just picking this thing up and putting it on mm -hmm. is awesome. You you live in an apartment, right? How is the space yeah. issue? Um, it's fine. I mean, I would love to have a bigger area, but the the system, what it does, when you put it on, when you first put it on, it shows you your environment around you. It has four cameras on it, so it shows you your environment, and you pick up your controller, and it map it has like it has like, you know, crosses on the floor, and then you just aim your controller at the floor to mark out what you want your area to be that you're going to use. Right. Hmm. And then it saves it. So every time you put it on, it remembers your it's called, you know, remembers that it's called like the guardian system, whatever remembers where you are. Oh, cool. uh, works great. Works great. I got a little mat, one of those round VR mats, you know, with little, you know, plastic knobs on it. So you can tell it front and back just to sort of, you know, make it easier on my feet. Um, it's, yeah, I don't have a lot of space here, but it's been great with a bigger, bigger area. You know, uh, my friend of mine came over here and he looked around like. Oh, and he put on the VR thing. He's like, now I see why you cleaned. I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I'm really surprised that we haven't seen anyone else make, like, like I know HTC, or not HTC, Valve has their the Valve Index coming mm -hmm. out or, or on the way out, which mm -hmm. is another wired product. I'm, I'm surprised we haven't seen someone else try to uh, chase after the completely wireless, all on headset device. Five? Yeah. Vive has the Odyssey or whatever. They have a system that they put out in China. They didn't put out here, and it's it uses you know there's the 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 Google Daydream uh, is this is the six degree of freedom. Um, but you put your phone into that, right? What's that? You put your phone into that, right? No, 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 no. It's no, it's not. It's it's oh, a cool. full yeah. No, it's a full system. No, it's not one of those gear things. No, no. Oh. Daydream's totally self contained system, but. It just uses one of these controllers, um, so it's not like that. You know, the the Quest, which has the full wrist style, you know, knuckle, whatever kind of controller. So, mm -hmm. this has got this had pretty good tracking and stuff for it. But that was the, their attempt at or the the Daydream Mirage Solo. But I don't know. They didn't like a, like a lot of Google things. They get excited about something and then they're not so excited about it. Where, you know, Quest, like I said, they've had they've been selling out like crazy. So you know, if people are still using it three or four months from now. You know, I think it's going to be a very viable platform, um, and we'll see. I I think, you know, like I said, the, the Vive, Odyssey, or whatever. I think that's supposed to come out in like September or something. Hmm. So, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna do one more pick just because it's really this is a cool Google product. By the way, have you seen Live Transcribe? No. Mm -hmm. No. So live transcribe. I've been, you know, working forever. Is you know, like I had my my app, my my app for do adding punctuation, which live transcribe adds punctuation in real time. Oh, I know that was forever been your biggest beef, and mm. you wanted you wanted. It's hard to write books uh, without being able to use proper punctuation. I just want to keep on watching it happen. <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah. It's really good. It's it doesn't do like what my my story voice thing does and figure out you know like hey this is there need to be quote marks in here or this is dialogue. It's not for writing books, but if you want something that does a damn good job of transcription, uh, this is amazing. And there's no need to pay somebody to transcribe things anymore. It is a free app for the Android platform, so uh, it is super super helpful. Originally, it was designed for people who are you know with you know speech or hearing issues to make it easier to basically you know communicate with people. 
but the punctuation on here is fantastic. They used machine learning, put millions and millions and millions of bits of text in there with punctuation and stuff in there to figure out where best it goes into, and damn, it's good. Wow. Yeah, the the you just had it pulled up on the screen and we could see it. Is is in, there in any way cool. to access this at all outside of having an Android device? Um, not yet. Maybe they might. Their their Google has in their speech their their text to speech or speech to text API. They do have punctuation, but every time I play with it, it doesn't work very well. Hmm. So I don't know if they're using the same neural network to do this as they're using this for. I'm sure eventually it'll make its way elsewhere. But uh, it, like, yeah, I bought an Android phone to like do, you know, uh, for Google Fi. But, um, you know, the upside though is it's like, I mean, this is this was like a $99 Android phone, you know, yeah. works fine. Yeah. So worth it alone for that if you really, really want some transcription. Hmm. Neat. There you go. Nice. All right. It's been weird. There we go. Hey, good episode, guys. Uh, anybody need to take a break? Yeah, well, I just got to make sure the kids are alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Be, our, be right back. Okay. Hey, Justin. Hey, Bryce. What's going on, man? It's E3. It's E3, Justin. It's a weird E3. Is it just me? Because I kind of felt like, and obviously I'm on the on the edges of video game uh, uh fandom right i think a lot of my friends are really into it and so i i buy osmosis kind of catch it but it kind of felt like five years ago the big thing was like e3 is dying or e3 is like on its last legs people are doing their own it's gonna kind of go the way of like uh you know wwd or no, no no like uh what was it was it mac world that like apple used to do their keynotes at and then they eventually oh. realized that like Oh no, we can just do it ourselves. Uh, yeah, you know, Nintendo doing their like uh, their own little videos that they release and and have all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but then this year, and I don't know whether or not it's just because now video games are such a huge part of like streaming and vlogging and and all these like and, and social media that now it just kind of feels like there's enough little mini kingdoms. Of that have like gigantic followings that are video game centric. That now E3 is like much more relevant than it, it, it seemed like over the last few years. At least like to my I totally think, removed uh, yeah. uh, way of looking at it. Well, I think there are two parts of it. I think there's the physical E3 convention, which is becoming more of a public event, um, and and then E3 sort of season, which is kind of I think the I think the, the the sort of tone that you're getting, which is like much more relevant, because I mean, the, uh, between Sunday and Tuesday, there are like eight press conferences, and Sony's not even doing one this year. Uh, but it's because all the publishers are deciding they can just do one wherever. Um, but those are also not in E3 proper, generally. It's uh, just they're doing it around then because this is when everybody's excited about games. And so we're all going to announce all of our games at the same time. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's weird. Plus we're, you know, this is a weird E3 because it's, you know, probably one of the last years for this generation of, of, uh, of boxes. I mean, you know, Sony not even showing up is, is, is a very telling sign. Cause I think, they still have the three games that they've been talking about the entire generation, uh, and they're not close to being out yet. So, yeah. Uh, How far off is Last of Us Two? We don't know. Oh wow! I, I, I my my gut says that they are holding off and going to make it a cross gen game, mm. because I think both the Xbox and the PlayStation new boxes will be holiday 2020, mm -hmm. and Last of Us Two is like a launch promise for the ps4 um wow really was yeah uh so uh, we'll see all right brb yeah but uh but yeah but microsoft microsoft's thing was interesting i think if you like a lot i just don't like the microsoft ips very much i don't like gears of war or halo really um but they showed off a lot of that and i think if you like that they actually i think the one of the funnest things was every year they always just bring out a car on stage because there's always some Forza thing to talk about their racing series. And so they did it again this year. 
Uh, and so they open up this door and you just see the lights and the wing, the wing doors open and they cut to the montage and it's Lego. They're doing a Lego expansion for uh, Forza Horizon. So it was a full size Lego car? It was a full size like Maserati made out of Lego. Oh, that's great. It was very cool. Uh, uh, you know, I, it's interesting cause like I'm, I've never been much of like an FPS guy or driver or whatever kind of thing. And that's always been, uh, I look and see what excites me about stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and that's curious when I watch this, I'm like, what's going to get me to want to play. And I look at some of these yeah. games, like, oh, they're so visual and open world stuff is a lot more interesting now, but, um, yeah. well, they started off with a, a new trailer for the outer worlds, which mm -hmm. is the new, uh, game from the folks who made Fallout New Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, Obsidian? Obsidian, yeah. yeah. Uh, that looks like some Fallout in space. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think, like, that's what, that's a cool way to do that. It's a cool, like, way to take that team who can make good games like that mm -hmm. um, and give them something new to do. Oh, I've been playing a uh, virtual virtual reality. That's fun. That's just... What's virtual virtual reality? I don't know that. Is that like Accounting Plus? It's a VR game. And so it's this, you're in the future and it's VR game experience sort of statement. Basically in the future, there's no, the only jobs left for humans are to entertain AI. <laughs> and so like in the first one, you get sent on like a uh, a, a job where basically you're in a kitchen and the you, there's somebody talking, you open it up and it's a big thing of butter because the AI likes to pretend it's butter. And so you got to rub toast on it. <laughs> 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 and then you know uh then but really what's as, as you're going through these weird menial jobs and stuff like using a leaf blower to keep an ai tumbleweed on a treadmill <laughs> <laughs> as he talks in an old west voice you know that you'll get these interruptions because people are, there's there's a story behind the story like the game is really trying to solve the mystery of like what happened and how did the world become this way or whatever yeah it really i thought you guys played this really fun no that's cool very surreal really really cool uh you know uh to me i like i love this kind of thing because you just don't know what the f's gonna happen next yeah that's cool that's hilarious virtual virtual reality like, yeah once i popped like oh what's my job oh i gotta rub toast on an ai stick of butter because that's its kink you know and that's what you do is you go to these different environments and basically have to entertain different ai and like and there's this one where it's this giant mega city in this big like monolithic building look like it looks like out of blade runner and it's talking about missing when the people walked through her and and and, and her favorite moment was when these parade float balloons drifted away and you have to start taking balloons and pulling them off a parade floor. <laughs> you had to be there, guys. You had to be there. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, that actually, it sounds a little bit like accounting, just yeah. that you're going between different people. Have, have, have you done accounting yet? No, no. They don't have that on the quest yet. Oh, okay. It's it's a fun 40 minutes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I actually saw um, uh, someone playing the new Island Simulator, mm -hmm. like the, the from the people who made Job Simulator. Hey, they put a game in that. It's a game now. What? <laughs> well, just because Job Simulator is fun, but it was free, right? Or, uh, no, no, it wasn't. No, it, it came it was... free uh, with a certain bundle I if see. you bought it at a certain time. But outside, I think it's what fifteen bucks or something. Yeah, but that but Job Simulator was always just like a little a little playground where this actually like has objectives and stuff. It was, uh -huh. it was neat to see them. Did you, uh, 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 Andrew? Did you enjoy the beat uh, the Beat Saber? Oh. So I did the the demo for it, which was cool. And then at the point at which I played it, they didn't have a lot of expansion packs on it. So I played the free knockoff Moonrider. Oh. oh, yeah, you were telling us about that. Not XYZ. Um, uh, yeah, that's a fun thing. Like, that's, that's I'll, I'll probably get the, the, no, they just came up, the Imagine Dragons music. Yeah. Uh, Beat Saber is wonderful. You know, it's wonderful, you know. It's yeah. just one of those delightful, like, hey, here's the thing. Like, I think lightsabers are cool. You know what else is cool? Music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know? All right. You guys yeah, do... It was, yeah, it was, it was, a, well, it was a, such a great step forward for that rhythm game sort of genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they have uh, Dance Central on the VR, right? I wonder how that works. Uh, Cause... There, there was, uh, there, there was some interpretive 
bone thing that works with uh, Vive Knuckles that somebody was experimenting with, where even though it only has the data from the headset and it has the data from the knuckles, uh, it's able to, based on the position of things, know how bones work, and it was able to map a full body from it. So Whoa. imagine VR chat where you are moving and it's an entire representation of your body, even though there are no uh, cameras on your body. And it's just, just, just by running it through, well, if the hands are here and the head is doing this, then he must be doing this with his feet. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, you know, I've not played VR chat yet, but that looks like and I just looking at the Oculus forum on Reddit and you know, there's hey, somebody here's a selfie I took with all the friends I made on VR chat. Aww. It's kind of sweet and sad. Yeah. yeah. Alrighty, you well, yeah, yeah. Yep. you want to do after things? Yep. All right, guys. Well, whenever you're ready. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, friends. Bryce Castillo. Oh, hi, everybody. That's me. And Mr. Brian Brushwood. Yo, yo, yo. Fixing the world. One show at a time. Um, so we have a question here. And this is uh, from Arthur. He says, hey, guys, I have a question for the show. I find myself working on projects that start off exciting and bringing them to final stages, ready for the public but then get nervous and find excuses to jump onto something newer, more exciting project. Sometimes the reasons seem very rational, but I worry that something is holding me back. Your fan, Arthur. <laughs> uh, Andrew, do you have a pen name? I, I, no. I was going to make that same no. joke. I was going to make that same no. joke. <laughs> oh, this is me, Arthur. Guy out, guys. Really, really. This guy's asking a question. Arthur Mang. <laughs> Arthur Train here. Uh, the question for everybody. <laughs> Arthur Massachusetts. <laughs> oh, I see. Just gonna mock me. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, well, I guess in that regard, uh, Arthur, you asked uh, the right the right person. Uh, uh, Andrew, uh, is this something you can relate to? <laughs> I wanted to write in there. By the way, Andrew, you don't answer this. Rocking <laughs> <laughs> my pain with this finger. <laughs> um, uh, and all seriousness, this is the thing that keeps coming up for me, and I could give myself an answer, but I'd probably rather hear an answer. And, and that is because I, I wanted to talk about, like, I'm in the middle of uh, my project Audiomatic, which helps you take a story or whatever and convert it into a multicast audiobook. Um, I got it into like, I think the final stages before I let other people use it. And then I figure out what's broken. I need to fix it. But it's, it's the anxiety stage. It's that, Oh geez, what do I do now? And, uh, I did it. Like I wrote a, like a question like this, cause I didn't want to make it about automatic. We'll make it about that. That's fine. Um, here's, here's my hesitation with the audiomatic. Audiomatic uses Google's WaveNet voices, which are really good to convert text into speech with different characters, different pe speech people speaking. It allows you to add background music, etc. I love it. I think it sounds really cool. Now, every time I use the Google speech conversion thing, there's a cost. It's not a lot, but it's $16 per million characters, which is about you know, uh, 16 bucks per 150,000 words, which again is not a lot. But if I said, hey, everybody can use this, and all of my writer friends started uploading their novels, I would have you know thousands of dollars a month in bandwidth bills. So I'm trying to figure out the right way to use it. Like I set up a system that gives you credit so you get like 10,000 words per month or something or whatever. And, and we, but, I, I guess it's worth reminding the audience what, what this project is. Uh, essentially, basically, it makes pretty pretty good enough audiobooks and uh for somebody who wouldn't have the ability to spend the money for an actual narrator yeah and i it 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 what it does is you you add text to it and then you click convert if it's if it's let's say it's a story and they're different speakers it says this person's speaking here this person's speaking there do you want to use a different voice for that and then it will create a mp3 file and you can add artwork and actually you can deliver it as a podcast. So you basically, I give you a podcast feed. And so like in my podcast feed, uh, every time I create something and make it public, it shows up. And so you can basically do text to podcasting with it. Right. So, Oh, great so price. I got the dip. Let's, let's work backwards from the nightmare scenario where you wake up and there are 
uh, let's say ten thousand dollars of of bill, you get a bill from Google for ten thousand dollars. How many authors does Brian that mean? Brian and Justin get phone calls, guys. <laughs> I need ten thousand dollars fast. How, how many? How many? I mean, like, I guess what I'm thinking is, is if you're in that situation, how many authors have you reached, and is that an indication that you have a genuine hit on your hands? And then now, like, wouldn't that mean that now you get to seek outside investors to really blow this thing up? I, but, but I don't know if those numbers track or, or, or not. Like, let's say if how if much would it cost to do one novel? Maybe we could start there. Do you have an idea of how much it would cost to for one person um, to do one novel through Audiomatic? Twenty bucks. My cost. Yeah. Uh, great. So you charge. Uh, you do it for free until. Uh, so so let's say twenty bucks. So that would make it what? Um, uh. Eight, uh, 500, 500 novels, novels Five, okay yeah so so if you do 500 novels free now you have a proof of concept and yes it'll be uncomfortable to be on the hook for ten thousand dollars but at this point you get to turn around and say hey uh this is the situation we're in if this is working out for you uh please give me fifty dollars uh, uh because the product will now cost a hundred dollars per novel Going forward, it's going to be great. And so let's well, say you lose 80% of your audience at that point, and only 100 of them stick around to pay $99 per novel, at which point you now have $10,000 to cover that bill. Well, here's – let me let me show you. Here's my – I don't really want to use it as primarily like a way to turn novels into audiobooks. I, 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 I want to use it as – and again, this could be my naiv naivety or my arrogance or whatever, like – I want to make it easier for people to do shorter form content. I want this to be the person that says, I want to take my novel and I want to serialize it over the next three months into chapter by chapter, or I want to write something for this, or I want to write, you know, self-help advice and make it into audio, into a podcast. I think of it as a podcast sort of format because, and I want to make it available to everybody. I, just, I want a platform that like anybody who wants, anybody who hates your stupid voice, but you want to do a podcast, this is for you. So virtualizing the host into a written source. Yeah, or think of it as medium or, you know, the WordPress or other things that we do and, and how what the WordPressification of podcasting. You know, we take for granted our comfort and it, but look at, you know, what our infrastructure around us to do podcasts. Most people don't have that. And there are a lot of people who like to write and would love to be doing podcast medium or audio content. And and I want to I I would like to make this as free and available for as many people as possible. Uh, well, hmm. then uh, then figure out the dividing line between. Uh, okay, so then you charge for audiobooks because everyone knows audiobooks makes money, and you make it free for podcasts because everyone knows mm -hmm. podcasts don't make money. And then what they and then <laughs> uh, I mean that's yeah. I, I, then that's dead, dead simple yeah. because if if you want to try it out and play it, if you have a novel and you think, man, I just wish I had an audiobook version because that's a whole untapped market and people keep asking me for an audiobook. Hundred dollars is nothing, and and those guys will subsidize the other folks who just want to play around with it, and and you know you just bake into it that that the only cost is. That at the in every episode, it automatically watermarks it, saying this episode brought to you by Andrew's product. Uh, uh, if you want to create your own podcast, go to blah 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 blah. So now you're getting ads out of all that, mm -hmm. and you say, oh, do you not like that watermark? Great, um, you could do a monthly subscription for ten bucks a month or whatever, and mm -hmm. all your podcasts will not have that watermark. Um, that seems like that seems like a fine, a, a fine dividing line. I can't imagine a single instance where an author who has a full length novel would feel entitled to get an audiobook made out of it for free. I, I can't oh, think of a single one. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm not so worried about that. I mean, I, I've set it up with a credit system where you get per month, you get X number of credits that lets you convert that. And then it's going to be automatically watermarked and then you can pay, you know, just, just, just like that to to sort of have it un I haven't set up the payment thing to do. I just right now I want to test it with users and stuff, but it is that anxiety of like, oh, well what's what's it look like in its its moderately successful form, you know, and that's what I'm looking at now and getting so here's, worried about. So here's here's what you can do is sell uh the option to buy in on the program 
to somebody like like basically do do a demo to somebody who has money and say uh i i think this will be very big i fear it will get too big too fast if it does uh if you will promise to cover the bill uh then when we know we have a hit on our hands you can uh pay the bill and get 10 percent, 30 percent 50 percent whatever it is you want to decide on that and that because then you remove that fear of going forward and all it costs you is a slice of an imaginary future pie that does not yet exist and yeah i mean i don't i mean i can cover a substantial amount of bandwidth life's been good but I, it's, it's it's the the and i'd rather do that myself than slice off something or whatever or bring in somebody when i don't want to at this but, point but, but but that's just it um, is you get to to decide when that switch is flipped like yeah. uh, you, you get to decide if it's happening too fast and you have too big of a yeah. hit on a hand in which in which case you get to press a button and all of that money problem goes away and now you just get free money and granted you're getting let's say half the amount of free money but you're getting mm -hmm. it at 10,000 times the rate that you had expected so mm -hmm. I, I i um i i think it's uh, i i understand the value of trying to keep everything in house but if what you're afraid of Quite literally, it sounds like another way to put what you're saying is, I'm afraid it's going to be massively successful. And if no, that's what no, you're... no, I don't. That's not my. I, I that would be happy. The 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 massive is happy. The middling where I get a bunch of hey, a bunch of people want to use it, but there's nobody paying attention to it. That's the fear. Is if if I have a lot of content, people come put their books or put their content on there, and nobody's listening to it because they find it garbage. That's my fear. Is that I can I can get a lot of authors on board here easy. That's I'm not worried about. But if nobody wants to consume it, that's the danger for me. Do you do you have a pipeline? I know you mentioned that you have it set up as a podcast um, solution, right? So you could spit out a podcast episode. Um, uh, and I know we keep we keep jumping back to audio books, but do you have a pipeline to uh, KDP or the what's the the KDP version of um, Audible? You're not allowed to use machine translation for Audible. Ooh, gotcha. That's so. a thing. Okay. Uh, what but about I, it, what about a closed yeah. beta? So that's, that's a pretty significant. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, and that's why and that was not I, I look at it as sort of a, a good point, because it means that because you can't you do that, there's not a lot of people. All the audiobook conversion stuff I've seen so far are kind of garbage because there's not a market like you didn't put on an audible. And I said, well, I don't want to go for the audible market. I want to create a different kind of thing, like a medium or something, you know, something that's a different way of doing, you know, text to speech. You know, I, I, I don't want to be Flickr. You know, I want to be Instagram. You know, I don't want to be. Yeah. that thing i want to be a different thing well uh why not why not start with a closed beta of uh, 50 or 100 users and they all have to be watermarked and says hey if you're digging this uh apply for the closed beta at, at this site well they can right now at audiomatic.com you can sign up for the beta um mm -hmm. so and that's going to be the next steps how many but, uh, are, you, are you comfortable sharing how many beta testers you have right now um i don't nobody has been brought on but i can do a check to see i've done i've tweeted it out a couple times let's see yeah. i also wonder if if there is any sort of um means of uh, like uh, some sort of commercial product for like talking about medium if if you had some sort of deal with a blog roll or a, a the verge style thing where it's like hey this we can power a very easy audio version of your site that you can put into an rss feed and maybe charge people for that i mean there even... are there there are wordpress plugins and stuff that do that now that okay. let you just convert to automatically convert your wordpress or your blog into that oh, I gotcha. um and i think that what makes this different is just the ad the background music and the other production stuff where you have to kind of go in and put a little bit you know a couple minutes of time into it the polish yeah yeah well so i guess in this case your number one um uh, uh, market is is to find popular bloggers who have a big back catalog of you know a hundred articles that are their greatest hits and it's like press this button start your feed for you now have a weekly podcast that runs all the time with the mm -hmm. best of your work mm -hmm. possibly i have 38 people signed up so far for the beta that's not bad that's pretty good yeah so. Yeah, well, there, maybe maybe yeah. throw each of them, uh, you know, however many credits and, and whatever, mm -hmm. whatever boils down to a, let's say, as much as a 
two hundred dollar gamble on your part, and then and then uh, like get get them started because I don't see as long as everything's watermarked, I don't see any downside. Because what you want now is a bunch of people lined up for the beta, and the only and the best the fastest way to get that is to get network effects going, where mm -hmm. each person using it attracts more people to use it. No, fair point. Fair point. Um, you know, and it's it's that you know the anxiety of like I've I've had this habit as you've seen of me I get things ready to be you know I I went from oh, I have ideas I throw them away like oh, I have idea and I built this thing that's almost it's ready for people to use and then it's like eh, I'm gonna go do something else that's shinier or easier yeah uh, and then I don't well, well I mean I think for for you Andrew the 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 thing that I think just unlocked so much of your uh, creative energy was the book stuff and just mm -hmm. able to because there was like a a beginning middle and end i got an idea for a story i'm gonna outline the story i'm gonna write the story i'm gonna publish the story and then you would like read a book about writing and then think about the next thing right and there was not only uh, uh just a repeatable full process but then also you know there was momentum behind it and and that i think kind of uh, cemented it but that discipline, I think, really, really, really helped you uh, in in a lot of other areas creatively because you kind of saw like it, it wasn't just all right. Well, let's do, you know, any of the million ideas that we had <laughs> that would would get up to a certain point, and then there was no there was no defined end to a lot of it. Right? There was like a like all right. Well, we'll do this. We'll have this idea and we'll put this up, and then either it catches momentum or it doesn't, and That'll be that'll be the end of it. And there there's always just an element of like worrying like, OK, well, is this the time where I stop? Like, should I stop here or or if I is this the one thing that I got to push through for everything to be different? Uh, and, and just having hard to find like, OK, I'm going to put this out for these kind of people and let's go, uh, I think would, would help with this project specifically. Yeah, I mean, I've made a commitment that I'm not going to drop it for a year, that that I have to spend a year on this, because I, I know that you can, yeah, you know, we get to things where we're like, ah, oh, let me ask people if this is a good idea or not. Unless something's like a horrible idea, like I want to sell ball peen hammers for hitting yourself in the nuts, you know? Yeah. Um, Hang on, let me get a pen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's Damn ball stuff. Um, uh, the ball ball hammer. <laughs> 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 um, I, I realize that, like, if you think, like, yeah, there's something there. That's this mu that's the best answer you'll ever get. It's yeah, it could be because the best ideas at the at the onset, nobody knows. Nobody knows. And sometimes you have to tweak it or this. And sometimes great ideas just crater. So sure. what matters is somebody behind them following through and paying attention and making the thing work. And so, you know, Dude. I'm past the point of like, well, let me just ask more people. Let me just and it's like, no, put the thing out there, see what happens, and then keep at so it so i i i know you have um i know you've done similar things in the past short form projects and looking at audiomatic it actually seems like one of the one of the tools that that you've made that you could most use for yourself like are you do you have plans to put any of your stories or, yep. or any oh, stuff yeah. through here because i think you your usage of this will be uh, a spark effect of of showing people different ways not just here's how you can convert a story into this here's how you can convert uh, an instructional or written part here's how you can put a make a dramatized thing like like i think if you show people and, and say like sell them on whatever that content is uh because I'm, I'm i'm sure you have tons of stories and, and ideas mm -hmm. for ways to use it um i think that's that's gonna be a strong way to kick it off no, 100% price. That the, the plan is is like in the next week or so is I'm going to start. I'm going to put out a podcast or two. That's one's going to be uh, a podcast on writing. I'm going to take some of my books and stuff on writing and put them into episodes, and just put that up. Like, hey, just to make sure the podcast part of it doesn't fall apart. Yeah. Um, then move into some of my creative stuff and do another channel because you can do multiple channels of stuff with. It's very easy. You create podcast feeds or different stuff. Then it's to bring once that seems to work then yeah because it's i've got to go use it to show hey this is how you're using it and then let other people come on board and see how they use it yeah so cool i totally agree yeah because i mean if i'm not going to use it then oh, yeah yeah 
That's the problem. No, I, I dog do, food tastes like dog food. Yeah. I, I do think that the contextualizing this helps a lot. Like yeah. if it's like, you know, we've, we've had conversations about where this could best be used either with, you know, uh, certain kinds of writing communities that are very large that would never have the, uh, you know, money to get a real audio book, uh, narrated audio book done. Uh, or, you know, I think the blog example is a great idea. If, you know, there's a lot of these great like personal finance blogs and stuff like that where, you know, people are, are telling a, you know, a, a, you know, a kind of a, a evergreen sort of story that like now could be a podcast now just like hey look in two seconds you could make this something that people could uh you know enjoy on another medium so mm -hmm. but it's like those are all good ideas it's just hey you know which of them you know uh have the rubber hit the road you know what would be interesting as an experiment is um to here's a way to do a side project and and maybe we'll throw this out there to any i'm doing this without your permission but imagine a scenario where uh th there's a podcast called story nori where all they do is they read old copyright free stories and and they're for children <clears throat> project gutenberg has a bazillion d of these and somebody could sit down and just make a competitor to story nori where all they do is uh, take a kid's story uh, run through this, add the sound effects, do the voices, uh, put the thing. And now congratulations, you know, you, you have a competitor to story Nori and it might, uh, or, or especially like finding an, an, a niche that, uh, that is unoccupied. That one's a little bit, uh, rougher because you're taking on an established, uh, first mover, but somebody could just do that. And then, and then and you could play, I, 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 I don't know, like, like just tell somebody, that they can use it, go nuts, and make all the money they want from that, and sell ads on it. Just keep the watermark on, and then, mm -hmm. and then now somebody has a side project. They've made uh, a, 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 an RSS feed and a website, and and uh, and and their own profit incentive has them making for you the most impressive showcase later. Because when they hit 100 episodes and they start pulling down, you know, 50,000 downloads per month or whatever. Uh, there, there, there's no better uh, advertisement for for your product than that. Yeah, no, I think that's a it's a great point. It's it's one of the things you know I was thinking about was man, maybe I could, I never even open up the platform. I just use it to automate, you know, turning a lot of content into podcasts and stuff. You know, like oh, let, let me take let me make an audio version of the Star Wars, you know, the Wikipedia, you know, the you know the Marvel Universe public domain, you know, free open sort of background information stuff or things like that. Because I'm like, oh, that'd be kind of cool. Each each day get a different background on something. Like there's so much content out there that I think would would be wonderful to be, you know, in that format. So I think absolutely. I mean, that might be a thing that. I do an example of that and then bring somebody on board, you know, convince other people this is what can be done. So, yeah. Yeah, but I would, I would definitely figure out a way to, to make sure that there's a profit motive for them so so that they and that they feel ownership of whatever it is they create. And it's like, look, man, I just have the magic tools that to make it super easy for you to crank out this content. Oh, yeah. I mean, that just it. Is, is it – you know, showing people here are the things you can do with this and, you know, when I have a podcast that – put ads on it and do this and do that you know so uh, yes all right thank you for your help it's been very helpful it's what helped us no for. problem arthur <laughs> uh, 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 uh. hopefully we are able to give him some advice who knows <laughs> you know. um any picks any picks hey i hate myself so i'm watching the handmaid's tale uh <laughs> season three i watched the first three episodes <laughs> What do you think? What do you think? Is it good? Is it good? Uh, you, uh, <laughs> I remember I, I watched all of season one and I, and like near the end, I'm like, I just feel awful. Why am I? What about this is I, 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 I what you're that grown. I, I, I very right, much so relate. Here's the thing. Season wait, 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 wait. You or is this a couple thing? This is a couple thing. All yeah. right. I think it's cleared that up right there. I yeah. was watching it without. Uh, Bonnie, which well, so all right, here's the deal. Uh, everything that you said, Brian, about season one, uh, uh, there in season two, there were elements that I really kind of liked in season two where uh, uh, they they did a little bit a lot more on kind of the lore of Gilead. I like that. I'm down for all their creepy ceremonies. Uh, the more creepy ceremonies, the better. 
they had at least like one an episode, so they knew that that was like a thing that they needed to hang their their hat on. Uh, and then they had an intensely uh, frustrating end mm -hmm. to season two, uh, to the point where I'm almost positive that they knew how frustrating of an end it was as uh, characters yell at our protagonist for making a stupid decision, much in the same way that the viewer would like to yell at the show for making a stupid decision. Uh, and they've effectively kind of like rebooted the show uh, with, you know, kind of some different challenges. It, it seems like in this season, uh, based on what I've seen in the first three episodes and the reviews that it, it's going in a more, uh, it, it's less about like, will she escape? And now more about how, you know, the resistance is working within Gilead and, and how Gilead is operating. So it's a little bit more kind of in the Game of Thrones stuff, but oh boy, man, they just cannot help themselves uh, with, uh, you know, every once in a while just dropping a, a, just a little too on the nose, like, oh, but these politics, huh? Mm. Huh? Like, here's a guy making a binders full of women joke. Remember when Mitt Romney said that? A million it's years the show ago. Now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look, where it's Handmaid's Tale. Cha cha. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, they've sold this season, especially in like the trailers and stuff, as like the turning point of that story. So I, I hope that that is what comes of it. Um, so I'll, I'll probably watch, but yeah, that, that second season ending was very, very tough. It was, I mean, and, and I, 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 it actually made me like the show more that they spent the first half of the first episode of season three, just yelling at the character, <laughs> like just <laughs> explaining that we know that that was very, very frustrating and dumb considering where we've gone. And I think there were some just really, really, really crazy decisions that they decided to make with the characters that are really contradictory to the fact that now in season three, some of the decisions that were made, which I kind of found to be unforgivable, like things that you can't have your characters come back from. Now those characters are like somewhat sympathetic and it's like, well, remember when that unforgivable act happened? Like the most evil thing that mm -hmm. could possibly happen. Like there's just, you can't uh, come back and be like, Oh no, what lovable doofuses. Yeah. Uh, I got a pick. It's called uh, AT&T's increasingly good ability to shout, this is a spam phone call you're getting, and this is a telemarketer, and just labeling it as such. Oh, that's uh, Stir Shaken. <clears throat> What's that? That's uh, a new protocol. We actually talked about this on, on uh, my podcast. Uh, Stir Shaken is a new protocol from the FCC uh, to try to combat robocalls. And uh, yeah, uh, I love it. That's awesome. Uh, I, 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 today was the first day that I had it appear on my phone, and it made me very happy. It made me feel very justified for never answering my phone. <laughs> I love to answer it and just not – I just don't talk. Like, mm -hmm. because if anybody who's there who would actually be calling me, at some point they would say, hello? And uh, that would be that. But with robocalls, they don't. So mm -hmm. I just, like – leave it on and the birds are like tweeting in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I got yeah. Uh, uh, apparently there. So this it's a new pro. If you want a little bit of a news dump on this. Yeah, please, please. Uh, it's, it's a new pair of protocols called stir shaken that the FCC wants the telecoms to implement. And there are new rules on the books for the FCC and, and Congress to pass that would let telecom operators make them opt out so they can get all the customers onto these protocols to actually s start blocking calls that they are pretty sure are not coming from. Uh, ah, so this is like phase first. one is identify all of them and mm -hmm. know that they have a reliable ability to identify scams or robocalls. Right. And, and then, then phase two is open the safe harbor so that the telecoms can make those active blocking uh, that that is a weird thing because it is sort of an implicit agreement with you and your telephone company that when somebody calls you, they They're will allow the call to go through. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and so, so that's you know the companies have to get on board with the program. Uh, the the protocol has to kind of work together, and then even then, it won't be perfect because at some point these guys will just buy a bunch of 
AT&T phone numbers and do that next. Right. Or, you know, they'll find a new way. But at least in terms of call spoofing, this will be a, a, a new uh, – it's, it's, a, it's a shining ray of hope. <laughs> so I got to pay AT&T like four bucks a month or whatever to – Block calls they should have been blocking I, already. I didn't. I didn't pay anything. It just suddenly AT&T showed up. Call protect the app is four bucks, but yeah. How did you uh, enable it? Oh, uh, I, I I didn't lift a finger. Just uh, all of a sudden. Uh, I, oh, yeah, I don't it know. Shouldn't, if... It shouldn't be an app. Shake and stir. That's that's the name. of Shake and stir should be a free telecom side thing. Yeah. Just this morning, uh, phone calls started coming in, and it just said likely spam, likely robocall. Because you don't have you don't have like a Mister Number app that no, already does that. that. Correct. So because you just showed it up and it said AT and T alert, right? Colon yeah. spam. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's cause I, like it's like paying the post office not to deliver you junk mail. <laughs> Well, I and, yeah, that. and, it's, and it, I can imagine a slider bar where it's just like, hey, here's my threshold of confidence. You know, if you're 100 percent certain that it's a scam, then then don't bother. But yeah. if, if, if you're 80 percent or 40 percent, then send it through and then or, or, or at least give me the option to answer. I think that those apps have a similar thing mm-hmm. where it's like, look, things that you're sure are not real, just don't even ring them. I think they have that option. I feel like I just don't turn that on because I'm afraid it'll catch something real. Yeah. But, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how this all shakes out because all that stuff still has to go through. But by, bipartisan issue. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's on small. the same page on this yeah, one. Everyone, this, this stuff's going to get there. I have, a, I have a preemptive pick. I watched about 20, less than 20 minutes of this before I got, uh, <laughs> I had to drive here to this. So I'm going to finish it before Court Killers. But I started watching the miniseries Chernobyl on HBO. Uh, it's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, it is, uh, pretty dire. Uh, I, my understanding is that it is, in, is very accurate. Uh, even despite the fact that it is, uh, British people doing British voices instead of doing bad fake Russian accents. Uh, uh I got a, I got a friend of mine who's really into the accuracy of this and keeps sending me emails, uh, <laughs> with various articles about what parts it got right and got wrong. His name's Arthur. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we had the conversation before about the accuracy of it. And right. I'm like, uh, first I'm like, all right, I don't know enough about it. I know some of the things happened. I read some stuff about what it got right. And then I sent Brian, like, here's an article of what they got right. And then I read an article like, hey, this is all the things they got wrong. And they did get some, you know, they make radioactivity feel like it's like this contagious disease. They really, I would... I think it's very. I haven't watched the last episode because, like, I hear oh courtroom drama about this sounds exciting, but I haven't watched the last episode. I find it very entertaining. It is very accurate in some ways. It is. I would say that it is very hyperbolic and exaggerated about the ancillary damages from radioactivity, and I'd say it's almost damaging and almost very, very. It's giving many people a very wrong, bad idea about radioactivity mm. or what happens of like you know, somebody gets infected with it and then they've been cleaned off and all this, like, oh, don't go near them. Like, what? Do they have an endoskeleton made of metal? Like, they're not going to harm you, you know? And that's the problem is they go out of their way to make it, they really, really exaggerate a lot of the effects. So, so, of so for you, it sounds like uh, it's such powerful art that is accurate enough, but just with the contrast turned up enough that, it it's sounds a bad like image you, for radio for radioactive right power. right that that it's going to have real socio uh, political uh, ramifications uh, as a result and that's annoying. It would be idiotic to have your opinions about nuclear energy impacted by this show. I'll put it this way: yeah, be yeah, entertained you, by you the are show. not looking for uh, the. <laughs> at every policy discussion, somebody said, like, dude, just watch Chernobyl and then tell me whether or not you that's want. Happening, though. Unfortunately, oh. it's a thing where there's a lot of discussion and people are watching this because their only understanding it comes from this show, which has this Marvel Comics description of what radioactivity can and cannot do. And, and we've talked about this before. The problem is, is that the Soviets did a lot to downplay what happened and mitigate what happened. And then, you know, we talk like, oh, there are only like maybe 30 known deaths from Chernobyl. Well, it's after those 30. But you go like, yeah, but they also had to move hundreds of thousands of people. There's the billions of dollars of cost. It's one of these things. It's like, hey, these people who say it's not a problem, these people who say it's the worst thing ever, like, I'm going to listen to both of you and then sort of evaluate this because I don't think the truth is in the, somewhere in the middle, perhaps. But, you know, mm. it's I'm worth excited watching. to watch this. No. Yeah. Uh, highest, supposedly, there's only five episodes. It's a miniseries on HBO, but... Uh, 
uh, the, I know last week it was going around, oh, the highest rated television show of all time, but it's five, just, so it's five on, episodes. On it's impossible. IMDb. Yeah. It's, I, yeah, it, it took the IMDb crown of highest rated uh, show, which, I, you know, man, five episodes. Who's that math? And, that's, that's not difficult math to do. Anyway, Chernobyl. Hey, cool. Chernobyl. All right. Uh, my pick is uh, a show. Justin, I, I've watched this show, and I think that like you'd be really into it because I know you like politics. Uh, you son of a. <laughs> um. I'm like sitting there. I was sick last week. I'm flipping like, I want something delightful and light. Let me go back and try something again that didn't hit me the first time. And I started watching this show called Veep. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody else watch it? Oh, yeah. I yeah. Think so. yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan. <laughs> big fan of Veep. What'd you think? Um, I, I, once, once I, you know, like much like Breaking Bad, like for me, I have, I had to know, like, like with Breaking Bad, like once I heard Vince Gilligan, Vince Gilligan do an interview where he acknowledged like Walter White from the get go was a bad guy. If you saw that in Breaking Bad, Breaking Bad to me, the turnoff was at the beginning. I'm like, first up, like, he's really a bad guy. He's just justifying these actions because he's angry about something. Or I didn't realize, I realized like, oh, yeah, no, that's what it's about. I'm like, oh, OK, now I can get on board of the show because it's not like they're trying to make this guy to be a hero when he's not. It's like, no, he's clearly a bad guy. We'll just wait to see how long before the audience catches on. Mm -hmm. um, Veep, they're horrible. They're horrible people. They're, <laughs> they're, all... they're, yeah, they're all horrible. It's politics, which is a very accurate thing. You know, as soon as something bad happens, there's this, well, who do we scapegoat? And they're delightful. Like, well, let's get rid of this person, get rid of that person. And then th comes around to their turn. And so it's kind of delightful in that and watching this just nastiness. And then with, you know, Selena Myers is a horrible, horrible person, you know. And they really um, do and... lean into it in that final season. Um, the the final season is like irredeemable. <laughs> like yeah. the, 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 it is it is a very nihilistic end to to that uh, uh, show. Um, but it does stick the landing in terms of the point because you're right, Andrew. There there can be no redemption. Yeah, for these people like they're they, it is just a constant uh, a parade of well, how do we spin this? You know, yeah. like there is there is no moral center. There is only winning. Yeah. Uh, I, so I'm, I think I'm in season three or just started four or whatever. Wow. Um, I'm enjoying it. So I'm enjoying it. Enjoying the, you know, the humor. Um, uh, Tony Hale, love him. He's great. Uh, great cast all around. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's one of those shows that, uh, so Amar, uh, uh, Armando Anucci, who did, uh, the, thick the of British it. version. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, thick of it. And then, uh, uh, is it in the loop that is basically like his uh, it's kind of like a crossover uh, that, that event. I think right. it, it might have been pre Veep, but it's a lot of the same actors uh, from Veep. But it was a, a a send up of the like run up to the Iraq war with all the in the loop character or sorry, thick of it characters coming to America and, and dealing with that kind of stuff. And then Veep comes after that. Uh, it's great. He does you know, a, a, a certain thing really, really well, uh, but it's well done. It's really funny. Yeah, I, I, I'm I, excited about the arc of one character who just got spoiled for me a little bit looking it up um, because one of the most annoying characters on there, uh, I texted <laughs> Justin, I said, this is the best turn um, I, I, since Jamie Lannister of of a of a character everybody hates you hate whatever and then something happens to him or all of a sudden he's a victim and he's sympathetic uh and it's like i'm like this is brilliant now i'm rooting for the guy you know yeah yeah uh, uh I, I forget what season uh it's in but it's one of the funniest as that character continues to evolve he becomes a bigger and bigger part of the show uh but there's a line there's just a picture perfect, like put it in a museum, hilarious uh, scene as as he continues to uh, to find his to find his destiny, which is yeah. So there you go. That's my pick. You all good? Yeah. All right. Arthur, thanks you. <laughs> <laughs> it's been after. It's been Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> 
Alrighty, that's a show, everybody. <laughs> um. <laughs> Alrighty. Hey. Can I tell you how much fun I'm having with my quest? It's you, great. I keep looking at I keep looking at that thing. Uh, I'm surprised they got the price. I'm still like in shock at how cheap it is. It is. It is a re. I mean, it's clearly Facebook saying, "Let's sell this with the razor thin margins, and then we'll make it up in the software." It's really good. Hard. The biggest limitation is other than you know the, the graphics being reduced. Although some people have been going into dev mode and overclocking them. Ooh. Um, and it looks really good. Uh, but you know, it's the battery. You know, it's the battery. But you can buy a little battery pack. And just plug it in and play as you go when you run to the length. But um, I've been, you know, it's just been fun. You just sit over there, just put it on, go play, then I'm done, and nothing to turn on other than just, you know, automatically comes on when I put it on. Yeah. So. Cool. All righty. Well, we're going to have Court Killers here in, uh, in a couple hours. Justin, you streaming later? Uh, No, probably not today, but uh, tomorrow. I'll cool. Uh, Andrew, got a, any Periscopes coming up? Uh, maybe I did one the other day. I might do probably another one. Talk about Audiomatic, and uh, do that. Cool. All right. Well, we'll see you guys in a bit. Bye.